Good evening. Welcome. We are a bit behind because we had some technical issues which are nearly solved. And I would like to welcome you here to our event in the context of the Alternative Green Week. And I'm happy to see so many of you here. Tonight, I'm Imme Scholz. I'm a member of the board of Heinrich Böll Foundation. The topic of tonight is new to many of you, supposedly. Of course, not those who have been into agriculture for a while, but in Heinrich Böll Stiftung, uh, agroecology is the topic. We think this uh, is a concept that needs spreading because it's obvious that agriculture has to change and we do think that agroecology could be an important key for that because it provides a systematic, a systemic answer to the crises that uh, agriculture, uh, agriculture has to deal with and that we have to find solutions for. I understand agroecology in the way that uh, agriculture that is operated in an ecologic world sets on regional ecologic processes and not so much on pesticides and fertilizers artificially created to help develop the biodiversity and the quality of the soil. And it's also important that farmers join up. That is a part of agroecology. It's not about production systems only. They join up in order to uh, produce and change the way of production and also to fight for their rights. In this sense, agricultural ecology is a right for a self-determined feed and food as such, um, especially also of a woman. And we are going to hear much more about that tonight. This is how we can explain that we think that agroecology provides answers to the global food crisis, the climate crisis, the biodiversity crisis. They all interlinked, and we see this most of all in agriculture. And this is why we want to show ways in order to change this, strengthen it, make it resilient, and also to reduce poverty and increase independency and resilience of producers and consumers. Uh, for these reasons, listed agroecology is a topic for many of our foreign offices and partner organizations. Our offices in Latin America have just uh, published a common dossier for that. A joint dossier and uh, a point made there is <clears throat> that uh, it comes from Brazil, uh, from Mato Grosso, where we hear how peasants fight against pesticides which are uh, sprayed by the uh, large landowners, um, impairing and destroying the uh, soil and poisoning the water. By that, not just posing a threat to health, but also a threat to the way of production that they want to go after. Our partners in Kenya as well, South Africa, Nigeria, Senegal, Lebanon, in the Palestinian areas, but Poland, France, and Italy as well, orient along the principles of agroecology. And with that, they provide a good uh, contribution to support food uh, supply in crisis regions. And even if the concept is not very much known in Germany yet, the current coalition has seen the opportunity of this in its coalition contract. Uh, but what does that mean in concrete and how far have we gone? <clears throat> well, tonight we are going to look at these questions. First, we want to look at an association of development to present their work of the federal government. And then we are looking forward to a discussion with representatives from politics and the civil society. Maybe a word on why there 
Some people are not with us today. The State Secretary, Hofi Lanik, uh, cannot join us, unfortunately. She's the parliamentarian, State Secretary, and member of the German Parliament. And currently, we are in the pre-election phase. Uh, we're going to have elections in Berlin. And <clears throat> what Heinrich Böllstiften, as a, a foundation close to the Greens, is that we have good access to green politics, but um, we cannot invite them in this phase of the election campaign because then it would be understood as an election event, and this is not what, what we're not allowed to do. But still, I'm happy to welcome um, representatives from politics and the executive. And uh, now I hand over to Lina Rick, our representative who has set up all this up together with her team. Thank you and welcome. Thank you, Ime, for the introduction. I'm very happy to see so many faces here today uh, on the topic which is very dear to me. And first of all, I would like to pass the stage to Zuke Bolmore. She is the um, a representative in the Dakota network because she is going to present a um, <clears throat> status paper which was published today and supported by many, many organizations and um, that answers the question on how far the government coalition has gone so far. No? Good evening from my behalf as well, on, on behalf of Dakota and the co-organizers, um, uh, Brot für die Welt, Ian Oxfam, and the Bell Foundation, Misio, and WFD as well. Um, we are grateful for the opportunity to present here tonight. What do I have to do to show the first slide? Just wait. Okay, good. Where do I have to point it? Well, this pointer doesn't seem to work. I can ask you to scroll through. There's not too many charts. Okay, can we anyway, maybe we could return to the first chart. Anyway, I'll just ask you to show the next slide if required. This is going the wrong way. There we are. Okay, great. So, uh, the status paper um, has been shared out, and you can pick one copy up or download it uh, with this QR code. Um, we show it again at the end. And uh, I'd like to get right into the topic without further ado. I think we all agree that uh, the food system at the moment needs a systemic, a systemic transformation more urgently than ever. Within uh, challenges that are growing, uh, climate crisis, biodiversity crises, uh, soil degradation, social injustice, geopolitical and economic instability, we are passing through half time of Agenda 2030. And the no hunger goal is on the focus here. And despite of global uh, efforts, 783 million people are in hunger and 8 billion people can't. Um, feed healthily. And how we are going to get this transformation forward has lots of opinions, but globally the most affected show that the guiding image of agroecology does not show not only secure food supply, but also helps to manage crises. <clears throat> Four years ago already, we appealed, together with many agencies, in a position paper 
which you can uh, see outside, um, to change the course. In this respect, one and a half years later, we analyzed in a first status paper the progress made so far by the big coalition as we had it at the time, but also the areas where they were heading down the wrong path. Now, as we've heard, the current coalition has recognized that the translation is crucial in order to face the challenges that we are facing today. In 21, the approach was anchored in the coalition contract in order to provide food and access to clean water. The half time uh, can be summarized together with um, 30, 43 organization to provide a half-time report and see in how far the federal government has laid out the tracks set forth in the coalition contract. We have to highlight, however, that we are looking only at the international engagement and in some areas address the economic ministry, the government as such, or the Ministry of Food and health. Before I move on to the positive progress made and the different trends, I would like to highlight that our state is based on the understanding that we need to follow a holistic approach that follows the FAO um, principles and the food World Food Association, and at the same time, uh, bearing in mind the fundamental principles of ecology and human rights. If we only uh, select individual uh, principles, like, for example, increasing efficiency and production, usually lead to gradual improvements only of the existing system, as you can see in the gray area in the this um, lower sections one and two. This chart is again represented in the paper itself, so we can look at it in detail. And the effort hardly ever goes beyond the limit of the agricultural operation of the farm and tends to slow down the development of agroecology, but only by the social, economic, and political principles it is possible to deliver the transformation on the ecosystem or even societal level, as we see here on level four and five in the gray box. <clears throat> Let's start with the status as such, and first of all, look at the positive trends. The first positive trend is shown by the fact that certain agroecology um, approaches are visible in international operation. The BMZ is operating in several areas in Africa and India, supports ecologic projects, especially established knowledge centers for ecologic agro farming and agroecology. This started a network of 40 partner organizations in five African regions. However, the planned ending of the funding by 2029 provides a certain insecurity for the future. A good development is the uh, um, observation of the bilateral um, program, which aims in order to provide and foster the right to food, my, bearing in mind the feministic international policy and the ecologic production. And this afternoon, we had got lots of example for these points in that program. Uh, gladly, uh, the um, federal government joined the Coalition of International Agroecology with uh, has 40 countries and over 50 organizations looking towards the transformation of agro agroecology and its 13 principles. And finally, in October 23, the federal government set a milestone for the rights of peasants in the Human Rights uh, Council of the United Nations. It supported the, um, the um, resolution in this respect called UNTROP. A special point has to be made on the um, effort of the BML in the cooperation with the civil society. 
uh, ecro, uh, agroecology is uh, focused here to implement the right on food and the parliamentarian secretary of state uh, underpinned this afternoon how important this aspect is. This can also be seen in concrete measures by Sha creating a department in the ministry for the right of uh, food or the different um, conferences like policies against hunger, um, also involving the special um, offer, officer from the uh, WHO. It's also important that uh, we are taking over the uh, funding of the special commissioner and special report. And uh, within the CFS, uh, there is efforts to create a coordinated mechanism for coordinated crisis reaction. This shows the effort made by the ministry in order to focus on the voices of the people affected and uh, establish means to react to crisis in this way. These positive developments are encouraging, but it's important to come to the negative trends as well. Altogether, the federal government has um, approached the crises and uh, not used them to make a turnaround. Due to global crisis, the situation for small farmers uh, worsened for um, uh, poor uh, consumers, uh, while the supermarkets and the large corporations made more profits. Currently, the uh, politics react to this with unilateral measures in order to increase production. So here we are the rather on the transformation level one and two. The long-term answer that leads to a sustainable solution of ecologic crisis, social injustices, and economic injustice are not present. And also, we unfortunately had to note that it is rather um, upfront solutions that are said here. The EU uh, plans a, lo a long, far-reaching deregulation of gene-manipulated plants, and by this does not give a free choice to the people. And unfortunately, the federal government does not reject this as far as seed systems are concerned. Also, the export of highly dangerous pesticides that are prohibited in the EU uh, uh, contradicts this um, uh, agroecology and uh, respective regulations in Germany are still pending. Also, the federal government plans to create um, fertilizer production from system, uh, synthetic fertilizer production from green hydrogen, which will increase independencies. This strategy rather reminds us on the failed strategy of the green revolution rather than a transformation to a better ecology. Although agroecology could provide a um, <clears throat> important contribution to food safety and uh, sustaining of biological diversity, the international strategies are not adequately adequately appreciated. In the strategies of the BMZ, these approaches in the development uh, cooperation are secondary, neither in the Africa politics nor the strategy to develop food production systems see this as a solution. And the discussed uh, shortening of the budget leads to lower funding capacities to foster agroecologic approaches. At the same time, the BMZ increases its commitment for the Global Bank, which is um, promoting top-down decisions and uh, promotes industrial production in um, agriculture. The creation of parallel system like the um, UN Food System Hub, the Global Alliance of Food Security of the G7, weaken these kind of established um, organizations to work for agroecology. 
And as the final chart, I would like to close off with the status saying that a consistent, politically coherent implementation of agroecologic principles is still missing. This is why we ask for a stronger institutionalized anchoring in of agroecology in the institutions, providing extended funding, and we also uh, demand to stop the solutions that are in the way of development agroecology. And also, we think it is important to establish transparent exchange formats and participations in the civil society. I would take it this far. I thank you for listening, and I'm looking forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, Silke, for uh, this excellent overview. We can now open the floor to the debate, and we will have another exciting input from the um, NGO Shwala. It is a partner organization of Heinrich Böll Foundation. So um, we have divided up this event into two keynotes, and we will have a discussion in between and then a final round of a debate. So first of all, I would like uh, to invite the panelists. Bess Rosada, she is um, responsible for Lean Development Project, Aging uh, People's Exchange, um, APEC. <coughs> A warm welcome to you. And Jens Busma, he's at the head of Division for Agriculture and Rural Development, Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. He has worked in BMZ for a long time, but he's new in this role. Then we have Leonard Mitzi. Um, yes, Leonard Nietzsche is the head of unit at the EU Directorate General for International Cooperation and Development. So he advises countries on sustainable development and thus also co responsible for agriculture, ecology. A warm welcome to you. And Markus Wolter, he is. Um, from the Missouri um, network and costs about um, nutrition. This is his area of specialization. Markus, thank you for standing in for your colleague, Sarah Schneider. She's also from Missouri. She has contributed to the balance sheet paper. And we are glad that Markus is standing in for her. And let me start off with a question to Bess. Why, from your point of view, agricultural ecology is um, a solution for your target groups? And what are specific um, challenges that um, we could find answers with? It's on. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, first, maybe I would like to thank uh, for the opportunity. Now, thank everyone, uh, Mr. Rior, and the organizing organizations for the chance to bring the viewpoints of Apex here. Now, and um, agroecology is uh, for us, for small farmers uh, in the south, for small farmers, indigenous communities. Uh, Agroecology is the answer. No, there is no doubt that there is really a big need or a fundamental need for transformation uh, of not agriculture only, but food systems, no? the production and the distribution of our food. Because it's quite different. When you look at uh, agriculture, most people see it as commodity production. And commodity is very different from food. No? And uh, for us, uh, with agroecology, especially people-led agroecology, uh, the change, the transformation comes from the farmers, from the communities. It is not change that comes from the outside. It is not change that comes from the corporations who have been, uh, in the first place, uh, 
been the ones responsible for the green revolution, for the gene revolution now, that is really squeezing, you know, squeezing farmers, uh, squeezing farmers and their families. Uh, I come from the Philippines, and in the Philippines, we are a rice growing country. We have always been proud of our rice, you know, we have like uh, 10,000 uh, traditional rice varieties uh, that have been taken away in the Green Revolution, uh, which we, in my organization, in my previous organization, Masipag, and I still come from Masipag, we uh, conserve, save, we have recovered you now the traditional rice varieties because we believe that it is the seeds, you know, the seeds that hold the key. Because once they changed the seeds in the 1960s, in the late 1960s, they changed the seeds. Then they changed the lives of farmers forever because uh, we now depend on the inputs, the chemical inputs, so that the rice will grow. Uh, we now depend on uh, labor, which means we need money to pay, no? because it changed the culture. It changed the culture of uh, the people. Uh, we used to have bayanihan, which where people help each other for labor, but now we have to pay. You know? the, the Green Revolution has changed our culture so that it is more cash-oriented. It has changed our agriculture so that it is market-oriented, so that farmers, when they uh, think what to plant, no? the, govern the government would always um, advise them, this is what is needed by the market. This is what will... Uh, what, uh, the feed companies will buy from you, you know? So that thinking, that thinking, the paradigm of it is for the market, it is for export, and large uh, areas of land are dedicated for export-oriented production, not for food. So you can see uh, in the Philippines, we are a rice-growing nation, and our farmers are eating rice coming from Vietnam, from Thailand, you know? It is really ironic, and it is only agroecology. Why? Because agroecology uh, holds the key. Uh, well, there's a lot of studies that say, you know, if you measure the agricultural outputs in total, in, you know, in totality, the total production of the farm, instead of per crop, instead of yield per crop, you no, know, you will see that farmers and their families and their communities benefit more from uh, organic agroecological production. Why? Because they will not have not only rice, they will have vegetables, they will have uh, fish, you know, because the fish can grow in their rice paddies. Uh, they will still have the snails that can be eaten. They can eat a lot of food coming from the rice uh, paddies and from, you know, from, from around the farm. But if, for example, you have uh, Roundup Ready corn, which now has uh, 875,000 hectares in the Philippines, you have Roundup Ready corn, and they depend on uh, chemicals. They depend on chemicals. Uh, for using the chemicals and the seeds, which is very expensive, they have to depend on credit, which you can get only from traders and retailers, and you have to pay a high amount. Uh, we call it 5-6. That means 120%. Uh, you know, very usurious rates, which means that, uh, and you use Roundup. Using Roundup means, you know, you cannot have vegetables, you cannot have other kinds of, you know. So it's only when people help each other in agroecology, uh, in production, uh, from production to processing, to marketing, you know, helping each other in their labor, uh, that is how we can lift each other up. And that is agroecology, solidarity economy in agriculture. Vielen Dank. Thank you very much for this very concrete uh, example of rice cultivation in the Philippines and the consequences of the Green Revolution. Mr. Busman, if I come um, back from Zilke Boimer's um, presentation, um, if I exaggerate slightly, it doesn't uh, look like a paradigm shift. And um, could you summarize from your point of view 
what is uh, necessary for the support of um, agroecology and um, what is uh, the role of it at your ministry. Well, thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you for um, letting me participate in this very exciting panel discussion. And I'm also very glad that uh, we have a civil society where um, societal processes are critically observed. And um, this paper is a very good basis for the subsequent discussion. It does not mean, however, that we all have to agree on everything. But um, this is exactly the point. We want to have a debate and exchange. And as it was mentioned already, we have uh, we are seeing different crises at the same time: climate change, the war on Ukraine, the loss of biodiversity, and then food crises, uh, uh, deep food crises, crisis that uh, happened since the assault on Ukraine. It will, however, not be the only one. So we all agree in saying that our agricultural and food Food systems need to be reformed in a sustainable manner. And <clears throat> agroecology is a tool to support uh, this um, process. Uh, Thirteen principles have been mentioned already. They really give a holistic answer to current challenges. And at the same time, climate and um, biodiversity will be promoted. And um, agroecological um, means will um, secure food in the long term. and. It is uh, only consistent that we in the federal government will promote um, organic farming and the coalition <coughs> agreement is not, is not, how shall I put it? It's not topical in every way, but um, agricultural ecology really is a topic that we take very seriously and that we certainly advocate. We also said that agricultural ecology is um, not yet uh, entrenched sufficiently. We at the ministry know uh, that there are six core strategies, and one is a life without hunger, a transformation of agricultural and um, food systems. That is the anchor, so to speak, a political dedication and commitment, but we also need theoretical concepts also in our partner countries. And this is a very clear commitment to agricultural ecology as a central uh, cornerstone because um, social, ecological, um, social and political aspects are uh, all united here. And we as the Ministry for um, um, agriculture and thus since uh, 2014 we've had um, ecological concepts amounting to 800 million euros and the budgetary situation is all but easy especially for us in our ministry we have to deal with that and I can't conceal the fact that we feel that the input not only for agricultural ecology, but for related topics could be on the decrease, really. And with this um, 800 million, 80 uh, projects were funded with a clear focus on agricultural ecological measures, the five knowledge centers, and the German English um, Lighthouse uh, project. And 
a further portfolio analysis is being carried out also with the aim of checking what principles are implemented in which project and how can we, you know, in my sector, we are thinking how multilateral contributions but also bilateral projects with partner countries, we're trying to optimize them. And the um, funding of agricultural ecology is uh, called for by the different players, and thus um, we are um, increasing our efforts in this regard. And we want to bring this topic even higher on the agenda. And uh, we also want to support countries who decide to move towards more organic farming. I hope this answers your questions. Thank you. I think coherence of policies will be a topic in one of the next rounds. Mr. Missy. I would like to ask you what the EU are doing in this regard, and the microphone is working already. So could you mention some concrete initiatives, please? Thank you very much, and good afternoon. And it's always a pleasure. Um, I come from DG International Partnerships. I was in DG Agriculture. So first of all, I'll try to ensure coherence and with Miserior and with lots of partners. Uh, since I have been in the Commission uh, almost 18 years, I, I think I never missed coming to the Grüne Woche um, and events like this in the past 18 years. And I welcome what, what the organizations here are, are pushing, um, agroecology, um, as not only as a concept, but as a process of transformation. Now, as Jens said, and I think also Silke alluded to, I just came from a GAFS meeting, um, and I actually left the GAFS meeting to actually join you, because I consider that Sie ganz kurz GAFS, uh, GAFS is the Global Alliance for food, uh, food, food Security. It was mentioned in one of the slides, which is a G7 uh, German initiative, which now continued under the Japanese presidency and continues now under the Italian presidency of the G7. G20 is Brazil. So food security is very high on the political agenda. That's a fact. Acrocology is not necessarily high on the political agenda, but it doesn't mean that the 2024 landscape should not push acroecology. You have Brazil, one normally of big proponents on acroecology, it was mentioned. You have a Lula administration, which pushes principles of acroecology, and also Italy um, pushes elements uh, of acroecology. So Team Europe will also play bigger um, on acroecology. But the financial dynamics the money the aspects, because here also, even in a civil society organizations, you are also wishing to hear about money. Where is the money? Where are the bucks or where are the euros? Uh, there, are, there isn't big money out there. Um, let's, that's a fact. Um, I come, Germany, you don't need, um, you have other speakers to speak, but you are in a, a cr crunch moment. Um, and the European Union as well. Let's be, let's be honest. We have a war which has been waging for the past two years. Uh, Ukraine is always mentioned in, in the media. Uh, we have a big war in the Middle East um, with spillover effects. We have hunger hotspots all over. So Sahel, um, Horn of Africa. You have elements in Asia Pacific, Yemen. Uh, Afghanistan. So, and I can tell you, my unit with elements in DGAGRI, so the BML equivalent of the Commission, we are part of the Acroecology Coalition. And uh, as many of you who know me, I have an open door policy to push the Acroecology agenda. And I will mention figures because figures, everyone likes figures. Um, politicians, uh, there are no politicians here, 
but politicians tend to um, throw figures and millions and billions. I don't like throwing figures just for the sake of throwing figures, but figures are important, but they have to be conceptualized. I just need to tell you that acrocology is also a geopolitical um, dimension. If I go in Rome, at the Rome-based agencies, or in Geneva, and I speak about acrocology, a lot of other donors, including the US, but maybe China, look at me and say, what the hell is he saying? Like, so, and in politics, if you go in many of our partner countries, there are different models of which acrocology is one. Others want other models. You mentioned rice. If I go to um, many African countries, and some of them are part of the Acrocology Coalition, many want to be self-sufficient in rice. To be self-sufficient in rice, it's high production and high productivity. Acrocology is part of the solution, but the counter model is high production, high inputs. So, and financial institutions and big international financial institutions sometimes, quite often, have the dilemma of how to reconcile the demands of speed, because we are in a situation of speed. Everyone wants quick results. Even in Brussels, sometimes they tell me, Leonard, I want results yesterday, not today, not tomorrow. But acroecology is not something of yesterday or now. It is a process. It is a tough process. It's participatory. I don't need to tell you. There are the principles. And to the risk from a financial investment point of view, um, acroecology, financial institutions sometimes, quite often, do not like to enter into that dynamic. So we have to de-risk ourselves to grant elements, and we try to scale up and uh, mobilize institutions like IFAD, and in fact, part of our portfolio that we have signed with our commissioner um, last year, it was almost a year ago in March, a 70 million portfolio with IFAD is partly also with the Belgian um, development is on acroecology. For example, what we are trying to do there is to support what are known as biosolutions, seeds, bio inputs, biopesticides, adapted me me mechanical equipment, value addition, and acroecology transition and advisory services and farmer-to-farmer -farmer joint learning. These are in countries like Madagascar, Burundi, RDC, Burkina, Bolivia, Brazil, Argentina. As you see also, fragile contexts. So what we are trying to do with IFAD, and for those who are in, in the International Fund for Agricultural Development, there's a Farmers Forum next month. There is also a World Rural Forum in, in Spain uh, in March, and we will push acroecology. We need also you to support us in this process of farmer-led organizations. Unfortunately, many farmers' organizations don't systematically push acroecology. Mm -hmm. That's a fact. So just to mention some figures so that we'll have time for discussion, um, we also support, um, first of all, we have a DESIRA initiative, which is a big fund um, which is also co-financing operations of the CGIR, which is the uh, big research stations across, across the globe, whether they are wheat, whether they are maize, whether they are rice, um, orphan foods. We want to push what are known as orphan foods. Um, although one of the director generals of CIMIT, which is one of the stations, told me, you should not mention orphan foods. These are sorghum, millet, and beans, and pulses you should mention them opportunity foods. So how to reconcile the big crops, wheat, maize, rice, and more um, um, orphan foods, opportunity crops in your diverse portfolio. This is something that we are pushing a lot. Um, we have 100 million um, Desira Plus for Acrocology Innovations, emphasizing innovation at scale, uh, multi-stakeholder approaches also, using farmers' organizations and platforms of research organizations. Um, and also we are giving uh, strategic guidance and technical advice to our delegations so that in their design stage of our programming, they know how to finance acroecology approaches 
uh, and interventions. For example, through instruments like budget support, blending, um, and in total we have eight interventions. What we really would like with Germany, um, and I saw a lot of uh, negatives and positives, and the negatives are higher than the positives. With Germany, uh, with a number of other member states, we can create Team Europe dynamics, but this requires big political will and engagement. Now, as you know, Europe is in election mode. I, I didn't know that Berlin was in election mode, but Europe is in election mode. On June, we will have elections, and this is a critical moment between what I call mainstream parties and parties which want to continue the EU Green Deal. The moment of truth will be after June. If Europe wants to continue consolidating the EU Green Deal, of which acroecology is the core, now is the time. But, as you know, the EU Green Deal is under a lot of pressure. So, um, we'll see what will happen after June. And thank you for that impressive description. I have uh, learned a lot about EU politic, politics on agroecology. Mr. Busma, I would like to turn to you. And I had announced that we're going to talk about the requirement of political coherence. What do you say to that accusation that there is a problem in this. And I would like to list an example here, which um, is a bit criticized in the civil society. On one hand, the BMZ wants to promote agroecology, but on the other side, there are uh, promotions of initiatives in Kenya, for example, for the production of synthetic fertilizer, in this case, on the basis of green hydrogen. And uh, the agroecology is critical about this. <clears throat> what do you say? Well, you were asking me whether there is a current pro problem uh, from our point of view. And from our point of view, we don't see it as such. But we have to make sure that coherence is also, in the case that you have been mentioning, um, fertilizer production in Kenya, that we can provide this coherence there as well. Uh, as Mr. Mitzia has just said, <clears throat> we need an, a sustainable increase in uh, production of our cultural produce in order to fight uh, famine and uh, poverty, and that the implementation of the agroecologic approach is quite a mile to go. And in this sense, in this sense, I would like to state or repeat that our core strategy in agroecology is in the focus. That means promoting an integrated, locally adapted um, nutrition and soil um, improving approach. <coughs> And that the focus is in looking, imp improving the use of alternative fertilizers. We are planning a global approach as well, a global program with a focus on uh, soil fertility and uh, cycle economy. And this basic approach, however, is not the answer to your question. That's quite right. We think that in sub-Saharan Africa, that's the context we're talking about, we have a specific situation. And this is why, but this is because the um, soil is strongly eroded. We have continuous uh, lack of a fertilizer, which has uh, worsened the soil and led to degradation of the soil and low yield. 
And this is why in this situation, the additional efficient use of mineral fertilizers does make sense because the organic substance is not available in the soil enough. And it is important to increase the uh, use of mineral fertilizers adapted to the local regions, adding organic fertilizer and in bearing in mind and uh, working with local farming strategies in order to avoid over fertilization and with uh, the view to Kenya and specifically in the context of our climate and uh, development partnership we promote the development of renewable energy so we don't come the, from the farming side but from the energy side rather and we support the build up of the value chain um, of green hydrogen and with this and with the promotion and support um, we have partners we need partners both because senior uh, kenya has set the objective to go along uh, beyond the and become independent of the import of mineral fertilizers decarbonize the production of mineral fertilizers and by that strengthen the country and in this context um, which is what we have to look at, uh, we do see a certain justification for this kind of approach. And there is more opportunities that this engagement provides. But again, this is a very specific context. And for that, that doesn't contradict the concept of agroecology as a central concept as such. Okay, so I take it does match up if uh, mineral fertilizers is combined with organic fertilizer and uh, regional um, traditional farming. <clears throat> Bess, from your perspective, do these kind of approach to transformation in the sense of agroecology, where are the red lines where this doesn't match up? Okay. Uh, looking at it from the lens of, uh, of uh, systems transformation or of agroecology, uh, in in the presentation, it was level one. I think you know you change the technologies of, of the land, so that um, so that that is one. Uh, uh, we say that high productivity will be the aim. You know, so if Kenya wants to uh, to have high productivity in rice, there is no other way but then uh, uh, to do that. So that means that uh, for me, if they do that, then there is no chance at all for them to do agroecology because uh, the chemicals, uh, or, you know, the chemicals that will be used uh, will really, the, whether they are fertilizers for the soil or the, or the sprays, they will really be tied up with the package. You know, this package of technologies come with the package of financing also, and it ties the farmers, you know, so that the farmers will not really have any way to to uh, remove themselves from the dependence. No, and another thing, uh, we live in multiple crises. We cannot look only at high productivity. What about uh, carbon emissions that will be uh, that will be released? You know, by the use of fertilizers. We really have to think of the long term. So when we think about agroecology, when we want you know, when we have uh, the political will. Because I think a systems change really needs a uh, strong political will. It can be difficult, you know, in the beginning. It will be really be very difficult. But if the farmers can do it, uh, and if, you know, if we could only uh, make it like uh, agro-ecosystems wide, because in Kenya, I believe that there are so many pastoral peoples there. There are so many cows, no? There is so much cattle, and uh, what does it need to collect the the animal manure to be used for? No, no. Uh, one thing uh, when we went there, uh, I saw that the problem is water. Uh, they really need, uh, you know, uh, water sources, but uh, the hills were bare, you know, so that. Um, me, not an expert, but I would think that the trees would help a lot. Planting trees would really help a lot in, you know, in uh, having, in attracting more water. Because we have found that out that if you really plant watershed trees, it will bring the water. 
you know, it will save the water. And uh, it's the water and the fertility of the soils and the fertility of, there was one farmer there who had uh, uh, dug a square uh, or a cube, you know, a, a pool of water uh, and he saves the water from the rainfall and it's large, you know, uh, maybe as large as maybe up to there. Uh, and uh, he collects the water and he has fish in it and he takes the water from that fish pond and he can already use it for his crops. And it was really green, very different in contrast to the farms around his farm, you know. Thank you for this very positive example. Um, I would like to address Marcos. Um, Zuka has told us um, where the criticism is. Where do you see contradictions in the agricultural policy of the German government with respect to agroecology? Well, again, I'd like to thank you for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to replace and stand in for Zara Schneider, which goes as far that I have uh, changed sex. So I have become a woman here. Um, but it's all about transformation, so uh, don't worry. So this is just a, a gender issue here. <laughs> OK, anyway, um, we have d addressed the green hydrogen issue. Um, talking about dispendency, I don't think that question was answered enough because I do fear that green hydrogen, the capacities have to build up for it, and they are expensive. We know um, energetically hydrogen production is uh, connected to very high costs. And with that, the concern is that the addressees, the small farmers, are not going to be the ones who benefit fit from that fertilizer produced that way, or in the worst case, by those who have the capital. That means the uh, big rose or tea producers in Kenya. And the qu water question is, of course, one of the central questions in Kenya. Where should the water for the hydrogen production come from? And uh, um, to open up new dependency, as sensible as it may be to use uh, chemical fertilizer uh, to boost things, but will that not lead to lock-ins for the farmers? And the question really is if this is really as coherent as it should be. And the second thing is that the coalition contract uh, anchors this strongly. I think the status paper provided information on that. But um, we thought that reaction of the BMZ is a bit quiet, uh, to be polite. Um, the coalition contract uh, was a strong signal, but imposes and commitment of the BSZ is, BMZ is not visible for us. Uh, the knowledge centers of ecologic uh, um, farming come from the former government. And the phase out has uh, started already of that. And also the agroecology projects have not doubled. We would like to see more transparency. What path are we going down here? There seems to be a good path, but it is quite relatively narrow. And um, as far as the World Bank is concerned, which we think is a questionable actor and stakeholder, we are uh, seeing cuts of the budget, for example, as you've mentioned. And now there's an increase of the promotion for the World Bank. How does that fit in? Um, well, so actually, there is more than two questions question marks to this. And maybe two more questions I'd like to address here. One is addressing the climate ashic. There's a US and uh, uh, um, Arabian um, initiative, Apex for Climate. We hardly see any connection points of what we see as a transformative process towards a cycling economy um, carried by the farmers. It is rather technology-driven, very capital-intensive uh, technology 
technological fixes, and we think it would be very interesting to hear your view on that. And uh, finally, the new uh, gene technology, um, oh, that's rather BML, but that's the deregulation that we see here with great concern uh, coming up that up to 94% um, of the seeds could be genetically modified uh, into falling into category one, which is not regulated. And we think this is highly problematic because it is, we don't see this as sustainable. Thank you, Marcus. I've seen people taking notes. This is why I dare the cut. I announced a second input, and this is why I would like to ask Yara to take to the stage. She works with a partner organization of us, and she works in uh, Lebanon agriculture, uh, environmental justice, and why this work in Lebanon is so important is what she will tell us about now. Please go ahead. So my name is Yara. I'm from Beirut, Lebanon. Me and my colleague Unsi just flew in two days ago from Lebanon to be with you today. So thank you for having us. Um, so just to give you a bit of background of who I am, uh, I'm one of the few people from my generation that decided to come back to Lebanon and to work there. Uh, knowing of all the crises that are happening in the region and in the country. And since I've been back four or five years ago, I've uh, been a, I've turned into a food grower and a seed saver. And uh, I've been growing vegetables and fruits in a small land in the mountains of Lebanon. And I also work with Jibal, that's an environmental and social justice uh, NGO in Lebanon. And uh, oh, this is not... This is a, it's a bit mixed up, but I can, uh, maybe it's, uh, I'm going backwards, uh, actually. <laughs> so, yeah. So I'm going to give you a quick intro of uh, who is Jibal and what we do. And then a bit of context of the uh, Lebanese context now politically, uh, environmentally, and, and agriculture. And then I'm going to be sharing with you some insights on some researches that we've been doing at Jibel and from our experience of how we can actually upscale uh, agroecology in Lebanon. So for those who don't know, Lebanon is this tiny country in yellow uh, that's between Syria and uh, Palestine and Israel in the south. And uh, Jibel is a small organization, we're 11, and uh, it was founded in 2017. And we work, as I said, on environmental and social justice uh, based in Beirut. And the two main pillars of our work are environmental justice education. So we produce environmental justice curriculums, uh, give training of trainers for these curriculums, work with learning gardens in Lebanon. And uh, the second pillar is food sovereignty. And that's the pillar I work on the most. And uh, under food sovereignty, uh, we do various projects, uh, for example, supporting farmers to shift to more sustainable farming practices or working on geographical areas, developing territorial food strategies to work with the different actors of this area to transition to more sustainable uh, food systems. And we also do uh, research. And uh, I'm going to just be talking briefly about these two researches that, uh, that we've done recently that are relevant to this presentation. So the first one was actually funded by Henrich Böll last year. And it's called Agroecology in Lebanon. And uh, in this research, we analyzed the, we did a mapping of the agroecology scene in Lebanon. And with the actors, we um, explored what are the upscaling potentials uh, to, to enhance agroecology in, the, in Lebanon specifically. And the second research that's going to come out this year uh, is called the Enabling Factor Study. And it's a study where we, did, we conducted a few interviews with farmers in Lebanon to see what are actually the, the, the enabling factors that are they're pushing farmers to shift to these different farming methods. So now I'm going to give you briefly uh, what's the context in Lebanon. So I'm just going to be talking about the last four years, which are already uh, overwhelming enough. So uh, the political context in Lebanon is that we've been going through an immense economic crisis since 2019. Just to give you an idea, the highest bill, which is the 
100,000 lira is equivalent to one euro now. And this is our highest bill and it used to be equivalent to 60 euros. Um, and we, al we also live in a very unstable um, region. Uh, just in 2020, there was the Beirut explosion, which is the second picture uh, that destroyed half of the city. Uh, we have Syria neighboring us in the north and the east. So a war that's been going on for 13 years. And obviously, as you know, the war that's happening in Palestine now, that's also been affecting us immensely. So we live in a bankrupt state, very highly corrupted state, uh, which, as you can imagine, also has tremendous impact on uh, the environment in, uh, in our country. So any type of crisis you can imagine, we have it. We have water crisis, we have garbage crisis, we have biodiversity crisis, energy crisis. And on top of all of that, the picture on the right are phosph phosphorus bombs that are being, uh, were being bombed by Israel in the south and the southern border. And in the past three months only, we lost 570 football field worth of land, which was mostly agricultural land and ancestral olive trees. So that's the environmental context we're in. And um, a bit about the state of agriculture in Lebanon specifically. Uh, so I just chose to talk about these three topics. So there's a very high exploitation of the agricultural labor. Uh, most, so up to 90% of our agricultural labor is working informally. So it means they don't have access to social security. They're not uh, protected for, from agricultural hazards, and most of them are actually refugees also. And a high percentage of them are women and children um, who don't have access to even the minimum uh, wage. Then there's clear unequal access to land. So the top 1% of landowners, who are not really farmers anymore, landowners, control a quarter of agricultural land in Lebanon, and the top 10% control 60% of agricultural land, which is insane. And there's very strong clear power dynamics in our food system, which means that farmers have no sovereignty whatsoever. First of all, we uh, import 80% of the food we eat in Lebanon, and you can imagine how unstable that is given the context and given uh, that we're also in the fertile crescent, so supposedly a very fertile uh, land. We also, because most of the farming is um, conventional farming, it's very uh, demanding on imported inputs, and so farmers are completely dependent on imported uh, chemical inputs, fertilizers, pesticides, and hybrid seeds. And you can imagine now with the crash of the lira, the dollars are insane. And so farmers cannot afford, can afford even less the imported inputs that uh, they're forced to use in their, in their farms. And finally, there is a very high dependency on the middleman in the wholesale system because the only place where farmers can actually sell their products is in the wholesale market. And this is the main one of the main issues to why farmers are forced to produce high quantities. So using monoculture techniques and using a lot of fertilizers and pesticides because they have to rely on the quantity of the products that they do of the products that they do instead of the quality. And so there's a very high dependency on the wholesale system, which is intransparent and very corrupted because it's not the, the, the state, the state doesn't e exist basically, so it doesn't really follow up on what are the prices that are set. It's really just the middleman that chooses the prices that this product should be sold at. And so what to do in, these crisis, in this uh, period of crisis? Uh, here I'm gonna just be sharing three main things that comes from our experience at Jibel and also from the research that we've been doing. Uh, so mostly working at the grassroots level is a very important thing because the organizations that are at the grassroots level are local and so they're, they have more vision on the long term, they are staying in the long term. The people who are there, who work there usually are also from the, re from the region or from the country, so they have more familiarity of the dynamics that are happening there. And so that's really important. And the second thing is really focusing on long-term funding instead of one-year funding, because grassroots organizations, usually we get one year, one year and a half funding, which is very time consuming and energy consuming. And we waste so much time and energy on really re renewing every year the funding. Whereas if we have three, four year funding, at least we can look more in the long term and plan our energy and our action more effic efficiently. And then the second thing that we learned a lot in the past year is really to focus on, instead of targeting huge numbers of farmers and huge targets of 
municipalities and farmers really trying to focus on inspirational models at the farm level and at the municipal level. So targeting a few farms per village or a few farms per uh, region that really will totally transition to agroecology and will be financially sustainable, this really influ influences much more farmers around because uh, they see a concrete example instead of wasting so much time and energy on a very large number without actual follow-up. And same goes to the municipal level uh, as well. And then finally, really um, funding or encouraging local organizations and initiatives that are working on diversifying market access for farmers, because this is really the root of the problem. Unless we find or really diversify the market accesses for farmers, they're pushed to really produce in a monocultural setting and not focus on the quality, but really much more on the quantity. So diversifying market access and there are certain also things that we're, we've been working on at Jubel. It's called the participative certification system where farmers and, produ and consumers get together and choose um, a new certificate that's organic or agroecology, they will decide, that uh, is different than an alternative to the current organic certification that's Italian and that costs so much in dollars for farmers every year. And it's not really adapted also to the standards of uh, the country. And so... Yes, that's it. Yeah, vielen, vielen Dank, Yara. Thank you very much, Yara. I think many uh, in this room found this very impressive. So once again, thank you very much, Yara. Und schön, dass es geklappt hat, dass du and I'm really glad that you've been able to come here and share your experience. So once again, thank you very much. I would like to make an announcement. I would like to um, take a little bit longer because we started off later and then um, you're able to continue your exchange over a glass of wine downstairs after this event. And we are lagging somewhat behind in our schedule. So I would like to invite a short response from the panelists and then we'll open the floor to questions. Well, you advocate the people-led development approach, and I think it fits very well to what Yara just described. So what would you ask in concrete terms from politicians? How can it be promoted? Uh, so funding is important, and uh, what is the role of governments in promoting agroecology? Uh, thank you for the question. So how would a people-led agroecology look like, no? And what would be our kind of uh, appeal, maybe appeal, not recommendations, but appeals to uh, governments and development organizations who are uh, represented here, no? Uh, maybe first of all, we say uh, that food systems are really hugely diverse, and we cannot say uh, that agroecology should be like this, that this is a package and you prescribe it, no? Uh, we are not uh, the, like the technicians of the Green Revolution. <laughs> so, so that uh, people-led agroecology would be, uh, of course, we rely on ecological processes as opposed to purchased inputs. Uh, they should be environmentally friendly. Uh, and uh, we adopt a systems approach rather than piecemeal technologies now. And a people-led approach would mean uh, building on people's existing knowledge and on the principles of resilience, integrating science, agricultural practices. Forgive me, I will read what I have written. Um, people use the resources available to them following their laws of nature and asserting their political will in the face of climate crisis, food crisis, corporate control, and state disregard. Because you know, these are really multiple crises that affect people at the gut, you know? It's really at the gut. And uh, people at agroecology means people taking action because it's really urgent, you know? You don't have food, your soils, so it's really, it should be by them, 
No, that's why it should be people-led. And uh, it's the assertion of their political will because agroecology is also a social movement. We cannot take it that away, you know, because in the face of like uh, the support system, the present support system of farmers, it's really, as, as we have seen, it's really this network of the traders, the financiers, the retailers, those who supply the seeds and who supplies the chemicals and who take back the harvest, you know, and who cheat the farmers. Who are very unfair. Oh, sorry. Sorry, no, ich, ich möchte dich nicht äh, unterbrechen, aber kannst du ganz kurz noch formulieren, was, was können jetzt die Regierungen machen, um diesen Ansatz... Die What should governments do in order to counteract these trends? Sometimes I get carried away. Okay. <laughs> so we call on governments and development organizations to support people-led agroecology. No? And uh, first, you know, I would like to uh, repeat what, we, what was uh, recommended before, to be the central program, you know, because are we for people or are we for corporations? Who are we really for? No, so if we are for the people, we, if we are for the communities, it should be our central program and funding concept for climate protection, climate adaptation, and biodiversity, and the guiding principle of all bilateral cooperation programs, and ensure the co effective cooperation, the participation of local civil society. No, uh, another one would be. Uh, because we have so many experts no, in, in Germany, so many experts, can we find ways to bring back the centrality, the, the sacredness, you know, I call it the sacredness, but it is the centrality and the availability of local traditional seeds that are not dependent, that are not chemically dependent, that we don't have to depend on the stores so that our crops will grow. No, We respect farmers, Uh, find ways to bring back and veer away or, you know, put the direction away from the OPOV, you know, the OPOV, the patents, the patents and the OPOV-like restrictions for farmer seeds. Respect that farmers have been the ones growing the varieties that we are eating now. Now, please respect that. And that means that make the conservation, the use, and the management of local seeds and indigenous livestock a central priority in development programs. Uh, and shift public support towards diversified agroecological programs that build on people's associated knowledge. Because people are our human resource. Of course, we are human resources, but they are our, what is called, table silver. They are our treasure, the shots. No, the people are our treasures. If we, uh, if we let the people uh, waste their knowledge because they're using chemicals and they get, uh, uh, you know, uh, they don't know what to do. But with agroecology, they know what to do. They have the knowledge. You know? uh, instead of top-down technocratic uh, approaches in export-oriented agriculture programs, not commodity-oriented, but food sovereignty-oriented, that would make the difference. Uh, so, corollary to that, we should strengthen the movements the community organizations to unify diverse constituencies around agroecology because this provides the support, you know, the support that is needed. It is the farmers themselves who will support each other, you know? And the farmers are doing that, but with, with the help of development organizations and governments, what, you know, uh, the possibilities is, are really limitless. So, Okay, let's hear what the political community has to say. Thank you so much. And over a glass of wine or juice, we will gladly um, deepen this dialogue with you. How can other players such as the EU support these endeavors and the significance of agroecology like in Lebanon? How can the EU give Give it support. And briefly, if any possible, so we have time for questions.
Thanks a lot. Uh, I don't know much about, uh, actually, the first time that I know about your organization, and thanks, Ciara. I'll check with our delegation in Lebanon. Lebanon is not an easy country. Uh, <laughs> just, just an understatement. So for us as donor community, the question is, and my political masters tell me, Leonard, you need to focus. Um, I have a portfolio in Africa, Asia Pacific, and Latin America and Central America, around 65 countries. If I include Lebanon, Palestine, um, Syria, um, Tunisia, Morocco, that goes to 70 countries. Do we have big funds for 70, 80 countries? No. So we have to prioritize. I'm not saying Lebanon is not a priority, but the question is, what are the ingredients you have to have good governance? Okay? I come from a Mediterranean country, which is a EU. Okay? I know Lebanon well because you are Mediterranean. I come from Malta. So um, vested interests are extremely a big problem in our part of the... So if you have vested interests, vested interests meaning middlemen, meaning traders, being politicians who are businessmen, businessmen who are politicians, then you don't have governance. You can do whatever you think is on paper, 13 principles, it doesn't function. So we need to help you, and for me, the predictability of donors, because we can come as donors, but you said, I want predictability, I want multi-annual. We can try to join forces, I can call a number of member states and say, what can we do in Lebanon? That's first. But if you don't have a top-down approach and the framework conditions, this, became, this remains micro. It can't be big. You are young, we support youth, we support gender transformative approaches, but you need to have good governance and good structures. Otherwise, financial institutions will not come in. You are one of the highest indebted countries in the globe, and there are many, unfortunately. So I, I, what I heard is, no to World Bank, no to the IMF. You can't exclude the World Bank IMF when you speak about debt, about inflation, about because they have to be part of the equation. It's also our role as EU to hold accountable financial institutions and to dialogue. But I think what's important in uh, events like this is that you approach us, we see what can be done, scalable, but if you don't change that ecosystem, we're just what we call um, touching the edges, and touching the edges will not do the trick, unfortunately. Auch da, glaube ich, vielleicht können wir das noch äh, vertiefen äh, später beim Empfang. Äh, ich würde jetzt erst mal Once again, you can uh, deepen your dialogue um, later at the reception. I would now like to hear from Markus Walter. What can be done in the German government in order to um, bring agroecology stronger in the focus context of crises in diverse regions. What needs to be done? Oh, yes. And Zilke Bonmore already uh, identified it. Where is the place for potential activities? And one is we have a great example, um, you know, with the right to nutrition. Um, with this initiative, and uh, there could be a department for agroecology that strengthens these efforts. And I would like to invite your applause. I think that's appropriate. And um, also promoting agroecology projects. There is an initiative for ecological knowledge centers. So how is it going to continue after 2024, 2029, respectively? If we knew how it's going to continue, this would certainly be an important activity. And there are other noxious activities, harmful activities, for example, um, the ban on pesticides that really do incredible harm in the global south. The EU could have a key role here for several months. This has been um, sleeping in the EU government and the fourth initiative, we have a great element, agroecology um, to 
discussion rounds or meetings, um, irregular and not very powerful, but we would like to strengthen it with a lot of power with different ministries at the same table. And well, maybe, you know, with some goodies so that you can work on topics and um, strengthen agroecology in general. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Marcus, Mr. Busma, short and concise. Maybe there will be two or three questions from the audience about what is the one demand as a take home message when you um, start your working day tomorrow? What will be your first step? Well, what's really important is the dialogue with civil society and shape it in a way that it is mutually beneficial and that it is perceived as such. The round table for agroecology, I would like to mention it as a good practice example, showing that we are in constant touch with civil society, but you have higher demands than that with regard to what we are discussing and negotiating. And well, the Department for Agroecology at my ministry, we do not have sectorial concept naming for initiatives. It sounds a bit boring if we say education department, health department, and a department for um, agriculture. At the same time, it is very uh, sustainable, but we should also have a political will to claim uh, to strengthen agroecology. But it doesn't work via the naming, but rather consistency in the efforts. And we need to make funds available. And another thing that has been mentioned before, we also need to do it together with our multilateral partners. So with the World Bank, the World Bank is there. It's a key player, particularly the indebted countries and countries with few resources that have problems to implement agroecological concepts. So it's important for them to be supported by the World Bank. And again, we have to have an exchange with the World Bank on what a partnership could look like. So it should, of course, take an agroecological course. Thank you. I would like to devote 10 minutes to the general debate. And then we'll be happy to continue that um, in the framework of an informal exchange. My colleague Hagen has a microphone. And he will be happy to take it to your place. And a question for Yara, maybe it can be. You can address your questions to the panel as well. Thank you. At the beginning of this event, there was the headline agroecology as a way out of the crisis or something. But I'm especially wondering how agroecology can work at a time of crisis because we are seeing multiple crises at the moment and agroecological um, promotion at the time of a war or exploitation like um, in Congo or starvation as a weapon like in the Gaza Strip. And then what responsibility emanates from representatives from organizations that um, defend agroecology as a concept? Thank you. And is this question directed to any specific person? Maybe those people who um, usually um, are silent on these questions. Well, and I've seen another question. Um, 
Ich wollte speziell noch mal an den Herrn Mitzi die Frage richten. I have a question for Mr. Mitzi. You mentioned it before. Auf Ebene wird das ein spannendes Jahr und mich würde interessieren, vielleicht auch noch mal auf die Frage von vorhin zu kommen. Coming back to the question that was raised earlier, what has to happen so that um, EU-wide um, that there will be an international dimension of the Green Deal, also with a view to the political challenges? I know it's a very big question. And maybe we can have another question, and then we'll have a um, round of answers. My name is Katrin Ebert, and um, I like to visit the Heinrich Böll Foundation in the run-up um, of the Green Week in Berlin. I'm a bit um, disappointed. Agroecology at a time of crisis. That's a title where I thought we would be dealing with our country. I'm not talking about wheat production in Kenya, but um, maybe talking about um, getting agricultural production back to our country instead of selling expensive technologies to distant countries that usually don't need it. And I only agree with Markus Walters concerning the panel here. There was um, talk of a war of aggression here. I hope that we will not invest any more tax money in this war. And I would have liked to see a different discussion here. Only 20% of agricultural production should come back to Germany. We do not need to exploit the entire world, and I would like to see a situation. So um, maybe the Heinrich Böll Foundation um, could maybe take uh, heed the fact that we should not support wars in Germany. OK, can we have one more question? The lady with the green sweater. Well, I'm a bit surprised about the notion of systemic approach and transformation. That's the same thing, a transformation, to my mind, well, we are in the midst of a transformation anyways. I mean, we are using less and less pesticides, and we have so many strategies, eco strategies, sustainability strategies, and I believe that, or I know that agriculture has uh, changed a lot, even conventional agriculture, and the share of organic farming has um, really increased and um, a systemic approach or a holistic approach, whether it is um, bottom up or not, I'm a bit surprised about uh, the wording. Is this a question for a specific panelist? No, it isn't. Right. And, you know, very briefly, I would like to thank for this event because the debate, this global approach was very, very interesting. Thank you very much for that. <coughs> So I take your feedback as a comment. So the question is, um, is agroecology a um, solution in the crisis? And um, your question is more directed to institutional representatives, a Green Deal, ecological, systemic approach. So who would like to start? Would you like to start? On the Green Deal. Um, the European Union has been under a lot of pressure in the past two, three years since the Green Deal. Uh, tomorrow and after tomorrow, I'll speak about the EU deforestation regulation. Like, this is a lot of under pressure, climate change, biodiversity. Like, the European Union is a colonial approach of staying what should be done in the world. Um, We'll see what will happen in June. We hope that the EU Green Deal is not put into question, but as you know, from countries here 
across the European Union, there's a lot of counter pressure on what the EU Green Deal should be and whether it should be softened or not. I think agroecology is probably at a higher level in the international agenda. We, as international partnerships, BMZ equivalent, are pushing it quite strongly. As I said, we have a Brazil G20, we have uh, an, an Italian G7 presidency. Uh, no one mentioned the Rome-based agencies, um, FAO, IFAD, WFP, mainly IFAD, FAO. We should use this momentum and you should hold us accountable and help us in the process, but come up with also counter solutions. Meaning we also want help on the ground to support farmer organizations to make clear choices. The case of Kenya was mentioned. This was a political decision of President Ruto on green hydrogen and green ammonia. We can't say no to a country-driven agenda, and we think it's part of coexistence in terms of solutions. It's not one approach against another. So the question is, to what extent a country has a clear strategy and a clear agenda? How can multi-stakeholder approaches be bottom-up and we support that process, but it has to be country-driven as well? Whenever we push an agenda top-down from Brussels into a country, it doesn't work. It will not function. So we are clearly rallying support, multi-stakeholder approaches. I didn't mention cocoa value chains in Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire, Cameroon, work around agroforestry, landscape approaches. I can list a lot. There's a lot of good case studies there. Let's work together during the course of this year, and then we'll see what the politicians say after June, whether EU Green Deal is consolidated, and then hopefully funds will accompany and be scalable in the, in the medium to long term. Okay, thank you. Um, okay, thank you. Who would like to answer the other two questions? Marcus, perhaps. <coughs> Ein Land, das sich gerade in einer massiven Wirtschaftskrise befindet und da richtig in die Ernährungskrise reinschlittert. Vor den, vor den Tankstellen lange Schlangen von LKWs, weil es kein Diesel mehr gibt, weil es keine äh, Devisen mehr gibt. Und davor war ich in Sri Lanka. Ein Land, in dem es nicht Hunger geben müsste. Es liegt in den feuchten Tropen. Wir haben fruchtbare Böden, äh, aber auch 50 Jahre grüne Revolution hinter sich. Ein Land mit seiner unfassbaren Pestizidlast auf dem gesamten Land. Und in beiden habe ich gesehen, wie Landwirtinnen und Landwirte mit Methoden der Agroökologie, mit Methoden des Agroforstes, also der Kombination aus, aus Ackerbau und forstlicher Nutzung, Sträucher, Bäume und so weiter, verschiedene Höhenstufen, es schaffen, in dieser super Krisensituation diese Situation zu überleben, und zwar physisch zu überleben. Und das hat mir sehr, sehr viel Mut gegeben. Und das, na, wir werden immer mehr Krisen erleben, und zwar sowohl ökonomische Schocks als auch eben kriegerische Schocks. Und ähm, das hat mich nochmal sehr überzeugt davon, das ist in der Corona-Pandemie schon zum ersten Mal sehr deutlich geworden, dass diese Systeme in der Lage sind, so resilient zu sein und so krisenfest zu sein, dass sie in der Gemeinde und für die Familie dafür sorgen, dass die Leute nicht hungern. Und deswegen bin ich so begeistert davon und denke, das hat, das the proof of concept is there. Ja, das haben wir geleistet. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I was in the wrong channel all the time. Um so um, we have just had a discussion with a World Food Program, and somebody said to me, the hunger crises are so massive in the world that we can't uh, do emergency aid. We have to develop different strategies, and these are clearly in a medium and long-term strategy of agroecology, um, because wherever we supply corn and maize and uh, wheat, that is not going to do the job. And this is a very interesting shift, and we would wish for political support for this. And on the ground, I think Yara and Beth can give us good um, uh, examples from their countries, and that's going to move us forward. Thank you. Are there any additions, comments from the panel? No. Okay, so I think that was a good closing word. And as we said, we can continue with the discussion downstairs in the cafeteria. When you go down and turn right, there is a small reception. 
um, with a little drink. And uh, so I thank you very much here to the panel and uh, the input providers. Zuka, thank you to you. Thank you for the co um, coordinators, Board for the Miseroya Ifam, and the Peace Service. I thank you for coming here and showing your interest. One more point I would like to ask you if you haven't registered in the list there is a list outside uh, go to the table and enter your name in the list that would be great and uh, we have the position paper outside uh, the status report if you haven't got it you are free to pick it up there I thank you very much uh, for being here and I wish you a wonderful evening <laughs>